All right, everybody, it's Ross the Fig Boss. In today's video, we're going to talk about my top 20 fig varieties that I recommend for a humid climate. And I think that's really important to preface is that these recommendations really are suited for people in humid places. So we're going to define that in a second, but this also doesn't mean that if I make a recommendation here in this video for somebody in a similar climate to my own, doesn't mean that these varieties are not going to perform well in a drier place like Southern California, Arizona, West Texas. To be honest, most figs and almost all figs will perform really well in drier places. That's just really what figs like is drier weather. The rain typically tends to lower the fruit quality. So the more rain you have, the rainier the conditions you you have in your climate, the worse the figs are going to be and the worse they're going to taste. But however, there are figs that have really been well adapted to these more rainy and humid climates. So I'm able to achieve even here in the Philadelphia area where we get consistently 40 inches of rain a year, or even let's say three to five inches of rain every month in the summer and in the fall when these figs are ripening, I'm still able to achieve a very high fruit quality, but it's really all in those genetics. A lot of it has to do with also, you know, controlling that soil moisture some other techniques that we've talked about in the past, but really starting out with the right variety goes a super long way. Um, so, you know, that's what this video is really tailored to is, is people in these more humid places. I would say if you live in a place that gets over 25 inches of rain annually, and a lot of that is in the summer and the fall, or if you live, excuse me, in a location where in the summer, let's say in August, you get about two to five to three inches of rain or more in just that particular month. So that really can apply to a lot of people throughout the country. Um, so this video, I think, really can help a lot of people and um, just in general make better decisions about figs because we're not going to just talk about and list off my favorite varieties here, guys. As much as you know, some people like to do that and maybe they have a, a list of favorites that they like. Maybe we're, instead of figs, we're talking about movies and they say, oh, well, Inception's my favorite movie. Or let's say, you know, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is my favorite movie. You know, it's like, you know, uh, what are you basing that off? You know, is it really just your preferences or do you actually have some, you know, characteristics or things that you're actually judging these fig varieties against or these movies against you know it's not just oh i just like old timey movies so i'm gonna go with uh you know some old movie you know um i want to give you guys the characteristics that i'm judging them against so that you can apply this knowledge to your own yard and your own observations that you guys make against the varieties where you live and you know that's the thing right even though i'm going to make these recommendations for you guys you know, I still think it's a great idea to come to your own opinion, to evaluate these varieties in your own location, give them enough time, make sure they're healthy trees to start, give them enough time to be mature, control that water, make sure that they're fruiting at a decent time of the year when it's still warm out, and then make your, your judgment. And apply those these characteristics that I'm going to make or give you guys and apply that to the varieties that you guys are trialing yourselves. So... That's what we do here is that we don't just make recommendations based on nothing pure hype as people seem to uh think that's all we're doing here on this channel but in fact let me give you guys and as we talked about in september the characteristics and what actually we're judging these varieties on so again as we wrote in september these varieties are judged on how well they perform in my low light humid climate the main criteria thus far is based on flavor slash texture. I really like, prefer the berry figs, but typically I go for a very sweet fig. The more complex it is, I typically tend to more like it. I like it more, excuse me. The texture I'm really a big fan of, more so even than the flavor, I think, with these varieties. Because the texture, if it's really gooey, jammy, sticky, or even cakey, as some varieties are just very thick, rather than a meteor pulp or a jelly-like pulp, I really prefer that. Um, and they, you know, really just melt in your mouth, really give you that amazing experience that 
you know, it's amazing that nature could even create such a thing. The hang time also is something that we judge these varieties against. And the hang time is defined by when the figs are on the tree, they're green and hard. When they start to swell, when they start to get larger, they start to turn color. Uh, we count the number of days from that point until we pick it. So when it's completely fully 100% ripe or just a reasonable amount of ripeness, we will count those number of days from, from that point, green and hard, swelling, turning color to when we would pick it. And that number of days really, you know, makes a huge difference for people in, let's say, really humid places like tropical places, even, you know, maybe you could say even Southern Florida. So, you know, here in my climate, we get 40 inches of rain annually. We get three to five inches of rain per month in the summer and in the fall. But people in Southern, you know, in Southern Florida, they're looking at maybe eight inches of rain in August or eight inches of rain in September. I mean, it could be a lot. So, you know, those hurricanes are really crazy and it, it rains almost every day somewhere in Florida, right? Isn't that the saying? So what you really need to evaluate in a variety, in a climate like that is really you need to pay attention to how long the fig is actually on the tree. Because if the figs don't need to be on the tree for very long, you can then avoid potentially a lot of that rain, right? So if I'm able to have the figs swell and then three days later, I'm actually able to pick it. That's a very short amount of hang time. That's a very short time that that fig actually has to be on the tree before I can actually enjoy it, before it gets all that sugars that it needs, all that flavor that it needs so that it's edible. It loses all that sap, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you don't want to eat underripe figs, but you don't want to, you don't want to wait too long to the point where the rain or something else is going to ruin it. Maybe that's a bird, maybe that's a critter, maybe that's an insect. So typically, the shorter the hang time, the more consistently you're going to be able to get a better high quality fruit. Um, and more often, you know, consistently, right? That's what we're trying to achieve here is that I can't ripen the best possible figs, you know, here in this climate. I have to go to California. I have to go somewhere very dry, probably have them caprified, right? Um you know, if I'm able to achieve that, then I'm going to get the best quality figs. But if I have a climate here like this, I'm trying to just simply get the best quality as consistently as I can. And really, I think the hang time goes a super long way, especially for those people in very humid or even tropical like places. We also look at the, the shape of the fig and the length of the stem. This really relates really well to rain and split resistance. Now, I've found that the flatter the fruit, it doesn't always apply every single time, but the flatter or rounder the fruit, typically the worse it is with splitting. It seems like uh, when the rain hits these fruits, um, the rain is then absorbed into the skin. It causes a fast expansion of the fruits. And when you have a fast expansion of the, the skin and the fruits, it tends to explode and stretch and tear. That's why you see splitting. So a lot of these fruits that maybe have their eye pointed up to the sky when they're ripening, well, the rain's going to hit that most sensitive part of the fig and it's going to split open right there pretty much every time. Two figs that really do that often is Black Madeira and Italian 258. The fruits don't have a very uh, pliable neck. So as they ripen, the bottom of the fig is facing upwards when it should be facing downwards. The most sensitive part should be facing down. So that's why the stem length really comes into play as well. Because if Black Madeira had a long stem, the stem could go down like this and have the fig droop. Kind of like a Moro de Caneva or a nice Celeste. And then of course, we think about the neck length as well. So if the neck is long and also pliable, then the fig can droop down and droop and protect that bottom of the fruit. So. A lot of these factors really come into play and um, it took me really years to kind of realize this that we can't apply a one size fit all you know scenario to every single variety yes the shape and the stem length is important but also what about the skin right because the skin as we mentioned here contributes to the absorption or shedding of water some varieties I found like Black Celeste really absorb or sorry shed that water very easily 
and they don't absorb that water. So there is no fast absorption of that water to then have this fast expansion of the fruits. Some varieties, you know, whether there's a depression on the fruit because of the shape or whether there's, you know, just the inferior, some kind of skin, they just love to soak up that moisture and they absorb it right into their skin. And that's just, you know, the absolute worst thing that could happen. So we're not only paying attention to the shape, the stem length, the neck length, you know, but also the, the skin and how that, you know, deals with water. We're also looking at drying capabilities because typically if a fig really can dry well on the tree, and this is anywhere, if it dries well in California, it could potentially do well here because it then has usually a good resistance for bad things to happen, right? Resistance to mold, resistance to spoilage, and probably has a high enough bricks so that it can resist a lot of these problems. Um, also, they typically, the drier they get, the longer they can hang on the tree, the better they taste. And not only that, but those drying capabilities also relate to, you know, how well the fig detaches from the tree or stays on the tree. So some figs, when you touch them and you're trying to figure out if they're ripe, they'll just fall right off the tree. And that's not a great quality. You want to have a good ability for the fig to hang on the tree without something happening to it, maybe wind or even yourself knocking the fruits prematurely off the tree. And that really ties in well to drying capabilities, that they have to be able to hold well on the tree. Um, so, and I, I have found, by the way, that the drying capabilities is such a great metric for whether or not the fig will have a very high fruit quality um, in terms of flavor and in, in terms of texture, because those, those fruits, again, are just consistently going to be at a higher quality and therefore they're going to taste better. You know, the best tasting fig here is the one that usually is the most ripe. And, you know, some people disagree and have different opinions on flavor and things like that, but it's pretty hard to disagree that a fig, the longer it ripens on the tree, the better it's going to be. And, and that's, typically the the case for most fruits um let's see here so we we talked about drying capabilities and then of course we're thinking about the ripening period the ripening period is um you know just if the fig is early is it going to avoid the rain is it going to ripen at a time that's going to avoid most of the rain or is it going to ripen later in the season in the fall when it is going to rain a lot more typically here it rains more in september than it does in august i find and even if that's not true, let's say the temperatures really pay, play a part. Because if it's warmer, the soil temperatures are warmer, then that rain doesn't necessarily matter as much because the, the fruits are then ripening quicker, right? They have a shorter hang time because the hang time is very uh, strongly determined by the soil temperatures. So if it's really cold in November and October, the hang time's excuse me, are much longer than they are in August because it's so much warmer in August. And the hang times here are going to be vastly different in the Pacific Northwest. And they're going to be vastly different in Southern California. So what you want is something typically that ripens at an earlier date or before the rain or after the rain. Or if it is going to ripen during that rain, the hang time is quite short. And, and it, for me, I guess a, a shorter hang time for anyone interested is about three to five days. Average, you're getting, you're looking at about six, seven, eight, or nine days. And then something, you know, with a longer hang time is anything nine or above in terms of the amount of days that it takes for me to actually pick that fruit. Um, and then, of course, the last thing we look at is the sunlight requirement required, the sunlight required, excuse me, to set the fruit buds because that relates to production. The lower the light that th a particular variety is adapted to, if the variety was grown in a low light environment for a very long time and is still able to set those fruit buds, you know that in a higher light environment, you're going to have a high productivity because you're gonna be able to have in a given area more fruiting branches that are then going to have fruit on them because they're adapted to lower light. They don't need as much light to set those fruits. You can have a higher density canopy with more fruiting branches in a given area and actually have more fruits.
But if you had a variety, let's say like Smith or Colonel Lippmann's Black Cross that requires a lot of light, they're really well adapted to the south and they're just not gonna do well for you in a lower light environment. They're just not gonna set their fruit buds because that requirement, whether it's the intensity of the light or the duration of the light, uh, whatever exactly that is, you need to fulfill that for every particular variety for them to even set the fruit buds. So again, the more light that the variety um, potentially needs, potentially the, the lower the productivity of the fruit. Um, I mean, that's just still a theory at least, but for now that is really what I'm judging most of these varieties off of in terms of how productive they are. You can have a, you know, a situation where certainly along the branches, um, you may have a, you know, a high density of fruits or the variety, even though let's say the light requirement is fulfilled, you have enough light, it's still putting out a lot of fruits along the branches. And if you were to measure, you know, let's say, uh, the average amount of fruits per branch, then you may come up with one variety is more productive than the other. But I would argue again, that if you had a variety like Celeste or Hardy Chicago, that was really well adapted to a lower light environment. You put that fig in now 12 hours of light every day, rather than eight hours of light, you're going to see a lot more fruits. Um, I mean, of course you're going to see a lot more fruits, but you're going to see a lot more fruits in relation to a variety like Smith or Colonel Littman's, even though they're both in those 12 hours of light. Um, it's just, uh, it's just something interesting that I've been playing with and a nice little theory, uh, that I think has some, um, good logic to it. So let's talk about now the, the varieties here that we recommend. As you guys know, from last year, we talked about my top eight. And again, we kind of went through this before we talked about Verdino del Nord. Nothing has really changed. This is still, I think my number one. Uh, it's insanely good. The berry flavors out of this world. Uh, you know, it's a smaller fruit that dries super well, has a shorter hang time. It dries very quickly. Um, it's productive. It does well in lower like conditions. It is a dwarf tree and that seems to be something I don't necessarily love about it, but, uh, it does put out a lot of fruit in a very small density. So that's kind of what I was maybe I should have explained when we were talking about productivity and light in that even though, you know, this fruit, let's say on a particular length of the branch, this fruit, even though the, the fruits are smaller, but this variety will put out many, many fruits along that length of the branch. And typically actually what's so weird is that it'll put out some nodes directly across from each other. So as it grows, it puts out two leaves or it puts out three leaves. And for every leaf, you could potentially have a fig. So the fruit, even though, you know, you would typically see it grows and then puts out a leaf, grows, puts out a leaf, grows, puts out a leaf. This variety, oddly enough, sometimes throws out two and three leaves as it grows. And therefore you have two and three fruits as it grows. It's really interesting. Um, and I have not really seen that in other varieties, but you could definitely make an argument that some varieties are very productive for a particular portion of their branches, um, which I think is uh, definitely something worth exploring uh, in a thought experiment at some point. So um, again, to me, it's very thick and jammy, amazing. I love this fruit. Um, can't wait to have more established trees of it. The Ruccello de Elba, still really one of my favorites. Again, it dries super well, even better, I think, than Verdino del Nord. Only at a six day hang time does it start to swell. Um, it's beautiful, it tastes great, uh, it's complex. It is small, again, both of these fruits are very small. But uh, for me, I think it's really difficult to beat them in terms of how they perform here and then also how they taste. It's just, you will, you will ripen every single fruit for the most part and you will enjoy every single fruit. Uh, we also talked about in this post, Hatib de Argentile, again, very beautiful, cherry flavored, complex. I think it rivals Smith in flavor. As it got older, it was better and better and better. It handles the rain like a champ. And I think it also has decent drying capabilities. Um, 
this one's I think vastly underrated. I don't understand why. Um, I know people like it and go after it, but I think it should be even higher than people give it credit for. Uh, I did graft a number of these trees. Well, I killed my mother tree of this. It was grafted. I planted it in the ground. And I was trying to get a, an air layer, actually, to put in the ground. Have a tree on its own roots. Didn't succeed with that. So I planted a uh, the grafted tree in the ground. That died last winter. And then this year, I got some uh, had some scion left over that I kept in my fridge all winter time. Grafted that onto a rootstock. The thing grew like crazy. Uh, I grafted it onto raspberry latte. It fruited. It put out amazing quality fruits. And I was able to air layer it. And then I put the air layer in the ground just now. So it's just been amazing, I think. Especially when you can get this variety very healthy. Uh, probably even graft it onto a rootstock. If not, put it in the ground. Rejuvenation, prune it. Make it very healthy over time. Moro de Caneva, this fig uh, this year produced more fruits than any other variety uh, at the largest size. So this was always one that I was harvesting, it was always one that was um, good in the rain, good with the fruit flies, probably the most reliable large fruit that I have. It's not large, I wouldn't classify it as large, but it's definitely... Um, you know, in that mid-size range, they're nicely sized fruits and they have great flavor. I think it's not the most complex. It's not the most intense fruit, but it is very good. If you can get them to shrivel on the tree, it's insanely tasty. Um, and for me, the consistency and the fact that it's a commercial variety, it's like, duh, no wonder this fruit is a commercial variety. It just performs so well. And for me, this got a huge bump up this season. Um, I think probably I would put this even above Hativ and Smith this year. Rosalino, my mother tree of this also died. I was lucky enough to get a replacement. Thank you, Wayne. This is a, a fantastic fruit that I thought was similar to the Hardy Chicago's. It's not. Uh, it has great drying capabilities. The flavor is so intense and fruity and grape-like. It's just mind-blowing when you can get this fruit to dry on the tree. It has good drying capabilities. The hang time is rather short. Um, I think it's I think it's a, a winner. And it, to me, it's, it seems like a no-brainer. We also talk a lot about Hardy Chicago. And I've been talking a lot about Hardy Chicago for years. My favorite is Azores Dark. And this year, I was really impressed by, as well, Norella. Uh, Malta Black has always been a favorite of mine. But I think I need to reevaluate that simply because Malta Black, um, I think, has always been planted in the front of my yard, actually out front here. And it, the soil there is extremely dry. And I had not really realized it until this year, that the soil is so dry out front that I was harvesting some figs out there this year for my in-ground trees that were mind-blowingly good. And I mean mind-blowing because it really had a drier soil and it was like as if it was being grown in a dry climate with a drier soil. And, you know, that's how I know, by the way, that these fruits taste so much better in drier places. I've grown them in drier soil. I've also tasted fruits from California that were ripened in like the perfect climate that were caprified from amazing varieties that we're talking about here. So, you know, I know the differences between that and, um, there's just no way that a fig like Teramo, although it is a great variety, I think, there's no way it should have tasted as good as it did. And the same thing with this other particular hardy Chicago type that I was growing. Um, again, I was just dumbfounded. But eventually I realized that, you know, Malta Black is in that same category. So maybe I don't like Malta Black as much as I thought. Maybe it's been the soil that really has been impressing me. So we're going to reevaluate our opinion on that. However, another fruit that really impressed me this year that's a hardy Chicago is called Conde. We did a nice little comparison here in this video recently. Um, and you can see some of the photos I have, or at least the video here. It's really an impressive fruit. Um, I was shocked. So that one to me has a great flavor. Similar, I think 
to Azores Dark, but I think Azores Dark has the better texture. Conde, I would give the flavor edge to. Norella, I'm still evaluating. I think it's right up there with Azores Dark in terms of uh, texture, but we'll see. Still have to evaluate that. But those are the, the three that I recommend the most right now. And then, of course, we have... I'm sorry, the last one here is Campaneri. And Campaneri, again, um, this is definitely the best tasting very early fig that I grow. This one ripens at the very first front of the line, um, earliest part of the season. And for me in that category, this one is the best. It dries well. Um, it ripens its entire crop very quickly. The hang time is rather short. Um, it resists the, the rain pretty well. It can split, but believe it or not, I had a lot of rain in August this year. And even in September when this fig was ripening and very, very few of them split. I probably harvested 92% of the crop and it was great this year. Um, definitely a wonderful variety. I think people, uh, will respect in the future. So, uh, those that's last year. This is what we, th we thought about last year, but I have some new additions, um, that I want to talk about. And some of these here were on the list last year and even in prior years, but I wanted to really narrow it down to eight. Um, this year we're just going to do 20. <laughs> I don't, I don't exactly know why, but we're going to be narrowing this 20 even further down in the future because at some point we're going to keep adding more and more figs and, um, this list is going to keep growing. I know that for a fact in that we still have a number of varieties that I'm quite impressed with. And I think I will be quite impressed with that will make this list. Uh, a couple of them just coming to my mind is Fane, Tolosa, um, Ponte Tresa, I think may be added to that list. Um, La Bourgeoisie has a chance. Grise de Saint Jean has a chance. Daloso has a chance. Um, and you know what? Even a uh, Adriatic styled fig has a chance as well. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of these keepers that I I like. Um, oh, Verdone Nikki is another one here that I would recommend. That I think probably has a chance. White Triana has a chance. So a lot of these fruits that are in our B and C tier list, um, I think we still need to evaluate some of them and they could eventually get bumped in here. Not only that, but there's a lot of new figs that I haven't even put into this whole category here, either B or C tier. I have very, I have not really observed the varieties that well just yet. And um, for me at least, there's tons of potential. I know uh, one that's coming to my mind is uh, Fico Salame. I think that one has a lot of potential. Um, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. So let's kind of talk more through this list. The new standout varieties, as we mentioned back here in September, I guess we could start with that, is Salato. Um, Salato, I have a feeling, is very similar to Noir de Boulogne. I think it dries well. I think it tastes great. The shape is good. It fruits well. Um, you know, the way it hangs is great. Pretty much everything about it checks all those boxes. Also, Nin V. Um, this one really impressed me as well because I was, um, you know, really interested to see the shape of this fruit. I mean, look at that. It's got a long stem, a long neck. Uh, the body here is a little bit fatter than I'd like, but it's really shaped in my opinion, kind of like a golden Celeste. It has this perfect shape to it uh, where it can hopefully shed the water as well as I think it, it should. Now, maybe the skin isn't perfect on it. So we still have to observe a little bit more, I think, about this fruit. Um, but the fruit tastes great. Um, I think it's shaped perfectly. It should handle the rain and, the, and splitting really well. I think it's a no-brainer to me. It does sort of look like Pistoluto, by the way which I find to be a little bit interesting because Pissoludo is awesome also on this list. And here it is down here. Um, this one really checks all the boxes. I was shocked to see that it tastes a lot like Smith. Um, it's really complexly flavored. 
the texture is great on it. Again, it has a long stem, a long neck, you know, a more slender body. It doesn't split very, uh, very often. I did note some minor splitting this year, but you know, I'm telling you this variety is going to do better than most in terms of, uh, in terms of moisture. Um, what I, I did notice, I think actually towards the end of our season is that it did do well in the moisture. So after I posted this, the skin really, I think is better for shedding that water and not absorbing it. Um, the hang time was good. You know, all these different things here we talk about in this particular post. Uh, the next one here is Vagabond. This one is really strongly flavored, has a blue skin, actually doesn't have a great shape to it. It's kind of flat on the bottom. It does hang well. The neck is very um, pliable. It can dry on the tree, the splitting, it never split. I was really surprised, I guess because the fig is hanging well and the neck is pliable, that even though the weird shape and the flatter round bottom to it um, didn't seem to really matter. So for me, I think it's, uh, it's really very tasty, very strongly grape flavored, excuse me. Um, I really enjoyed this piece of fruit. Um, and really all the figs off of this particular tree. I mean, all of these varieties that I'm mentioning here, it wasn't just one fruit. I evaluated a number of fruits throughout the season. Um, the last one here that we added to the, the top five list from the summer was black Celeste. And I think this actually is, I want to say it's almost neck and neck with Ferdino del Nord. I really do. I think it's pretty much right up there because nothing happens to it. It's kind of insane. Um, you know, uh, it's really amazing that, um, the fruit flies can't penetrate through the skin. It seems like, and it just never splits. Not only does it never split, but the rain never gets absorbed into the fruit. It seems like it's completely unaffected by moisture. And that was like mind blowing to me. You know, um, it seems like Verdino del Nord, as an example, it dries so well on the tree that it, even though it may absorb some water, it still resists all that mold and fermentation and spoilage. It just has that ability to resist all that crap. Whereas this fig, it doesn't really need to resist it because it just doesn't get affected by anything. It's like, it really is amazing. Um, the skin really blows my mind on this particular variety to the point where I'm like, uh, really need to evaluate every single variety all over again in a way to just really look at the skin. You know, really pay attention to the skin and the moisture on that skin because there's something about this, the skin on this fruit, guys. I'm telling you, um, it's it just, uh, it's like this velvety feeling too, but it's not furry. I know my, Ver, my Ver, uh, Verdone from Nikki is a bit furry and so is um, White Marseille can have a furrier skin to it. So it's not like that. It's just like, like just something about it. It's just, I can't even really describe it. I'll have to really point it out in future years, but to me, it was just so surprising, um, to notice that. Um, and then one of the other standouts this year was the Verdone from, uh, from Nikki. I was really surprised about that fruit. I like the shape. It's more oval. The flavor's fantastic on it. So what else did we add? Um, well, I think you can't forget about Celeste. So just Celeste in general, there will be a type of Celeste. Um, you know, there is black Celeste, which is clearly different than Celeste. Um, even my friend, Steve, I was talking to him recently. He really agreed with me and, uh, he thought it was a very interesting thought because, you know, it looks just like a Celeste. A lot of the, the, the shape of the fruit, the leaves look the same the way that the tree grows. I mean, you would never really know unless you looked at the fruits um, and the, the colors, the flavor, um, you know, the fruits themselves are just so vastly different uh, other than really the shape. And I guess the fact that it's a sweeter fruit um, that we were just like, wow, what, what even is this thing? Is it like a seedling? Is it a mutation? Is it, you know, it's just such an interesting, I think, thought, but Regardless, I think there will be a, a strain of 
let's say blue celeste or celeste whatever you want to call it that will be a favorite of mine as well i think really just celeste in general is so incredible um that it will be you know for me um something that i'm going to continue to keep evaluating and i think there will be one whether that's like stallion the one you know uh violet de marseille uh, my friend Manny has one of them. There's also the Patrick Supergiant Knot. There's there's so many different Celeste, random Celestes. There's even uh, Sweet Diana. Uh, you know, I'm trialing pretty much as many of them as I can. There's one I have from a number of random people that have messaged me and reached out to me. I even have one from uh, the Jersey Shore that I found this tree that looks amazing. I also found or I also got the Becknell Celeste. There's even Improved Celeste. I mean, it just it just goes on and on and on. Um, so yeah, for me, one of them is going to be in this in this category for sure, like without a doubt. Whatever that is, I don't know yet. Uh, Vertolino is a new fig that, you know, oddly enough, we didn't get a chance to uh, talk about it in that post, just simply because. Uh, you know, I, I ripened this thing after I made that post. And I was really surprised to see just how amazing the fruits actually are. I was just shocked because, um, first off, I knew that the shape, the stem, the length of the neck, I knew that was going to be great. You could see how elongated the fruit is and how slender the body is. Um, look at that. Um, obviously, this one here isn't very pretty, but... I don't think they're all going to be like that, but this is the perfect shape we look for. You know, this is going to have the, the best split resistance you could ask for. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily know the hang time, but I think it's about average or on, it's not long. That's for certain. Um, by the way, Black Celeste has a really short hang time. And I find that some of the other strains of Celeste have a much longer hang time, um, which is a bit, you know, a bit strange again going back to that prior discussion but vertolino here um you know it really has an amazing flavor this is like not only does it perform super well right it also it can fruit by the way in in, sh in lower light environments so it should be a very productive fruit it's not the largest fruit but what's amazing i think even beyond just all the other things I mentioned is that it's amazingly flavored. This is like seriously one of the best tasting fruits. Um, not only is the flavor complex and intense, but the uh, the texture is a lot like a cold adam. It's so thick and jammy and, and cakey actually that it is a uh, really really impressive. Like this is by far and away this this will be I think. You know, this may even be like in the top five or maybe even at some point in the future be one of the very few figs I grow. You know, this one will make the cut, I think, at some point in the future. Um, yeah, so top 20, but this really, this fig belongs in like a whole separate class, personally. We also had a Green Michurinska. So if I go back to the blog, Green Michurinska was one that I was kind of... Uh, you know, pointing out to people in that fo top five list from the summer. But as I ripened more and more of these fruits, I realized how great this fruit actually is. I mean, it was just insane. First off, I really like the flavor. I originally thought that it wasn't an Adriatic type, as I mentioned here. But as the fruits ripened and I had more and more and more of them, more of them started to taste more like an Adriatic. I was really kind of blown away. Um, it produces great quality fruits. There's a lot of them. Um, it fruits well in low light conditions. The hang time isn't very long. Um, you don't even need, yeah, you really can pick it at an earlier date. You don't need to let it sit there on a long time on the tree. Um, and it just really doesn't seem to split that often. You know, um, I don't really know how early it ripens. I think I need to grow it in a container to really find that out. But uh, 
it definitely doesn't ripen too late. You know, it doesn't seem to be even maybe on the late side of mid season. It's definitely early to mid. And I think, um, you know, this is such a great fig. It really is. It checks all the boxes. This guy, Penn and Pike, who found this fruit, was also responsible for Vagabond. Those two are just amazing fruits. Like, that guy really knows what he's doing. That guy really knows fruit. I'll tell you that. Um, I think he even is a farmer. I think he even has an, uh, a blueberry orchard or something. Okay. So that, that's Green Michurinska. I mean, now, here's the thing about Green Michurinska. Let's assume it is an Adriatic. I'm not sure. But I will say that I would like to put an Adriatic fig in that top 20 list at some point. So whether or not, you know, let's say Green Michurinska is in that list, you know, years from now, maybe it's prosciutto, right? Uh, prosciutto really impressed me. This one seems to be more intensely flavored than Green Michurinska. Uh, definitely from the beginning, it's more intensely flavored. The hang time seems to be rather short. It dries really well on the tree. It can split, but a very minor split. And I'm hoping that when I put this in the ground, I'm planting a tree. I already put the tree in the ground, I think. I'm hoping that this one will split just a bit less. And, um... That to me would give it a huge edge because as we plant these trees in the ground, they change. The the, the length of the stem gets larger, the length of the neck gets larger. Uh, the fruits typically I find have more energy. This is something we're gonna talk about in the next video to wrap up our season. But I just find that uh, these figs, um, they change they have so much more energy i think that's being directed into the fruits that uh it really does make this fruit or it would i would imagine make prosciutto a better fruit in terms of rain and in terms of splitting um so i think that's an interesting little for me something that we may, we may get to see in the future but it has really extremely high fruit quality so um it's a winner and that would be a, a winner pretty much i think you could take that one to the bank in a dry climate too you know um so you know there's that um so that's prosciutto but i also think by the way that whether it's green michurinska whether it's prosciutto i mean we still keep trialing more and more of these adriatic types whether or not you even classify them as that, it's so unusual and interesting to think about. But Blanche de Duce Zahn's also on that list. You might even be able to put JH Adriatic in there or Rockaway Green. You could even think about um, Verdino Giacomo. There's so many more of these that I'm going to try out. Strawberry Verte has always been a favorite of mine. Uh, White Madeira number one. So we'll see. We're going to get a good idea, I think. Um, also here, let's move on. We talked about these. We talked about Salato. Smith. Did I mention Smith? <laughs> Somehow I think I skipped over Smith. But Smith was originally part of the top eight. And um, I harvested, I think that was number two in terms of my, you know, most productive, highly flavored, uh, ripening every single fruit without any error variety this year. Uh, it just kept putting out the fruits consistently at a super high quality. Same thing with Azores Dark and, and Conde. You know, that's what, just what the hardy Chicago types do. Um, so Smith, for me, is like, it doesn't get enough credit. I mean, I just had someone message me today. It's the 23rd of November. And they sent me a photo of smith ripening on the 23rd of november and it just it's just amazing it doesn't matter what time of the year the flavor even evolved for me a little bit and turned very cakey in the summer i was blown away uh what an incredible piece of fruit Alrighty, so zafiro um it's still on the list man and this to me has got to be I think still, and you could tell by a lot of the photos that are coming out of this variety, even though my, my tree had died, uh, I fruited it, I grafted it onto one of my trees, 
the graft I cut the graft union too far back and the the pieces that I left behind of the scion just dried out and uh, I lost the variety since I finally replaced it I got myself a tree um, I would like to try to find my original source uh, lineage of the tree um, but for the most part I believe that this still is a, a very good fig even in very rainy conditions you know um, it is still I think the most interesting and weird very very good honey fig that I've tried and you can see it's the only real honey fig on this list um, you know I think there is a place in the future where I'm you know I'm evaluating more and more and more uh, of specific honey figs one is called Corinth uh, we did sort of make a video on these, but I, I think I deleted them or maybe I still have to edit it or whatever it is. But Corinth to me really seems to be one that could potentially not split that often. Same thing with Moscatel Bronco. And, um, what's the other one? I have a strain of Peter's honey that I found that, uh, really seems to have a more elongated shape. And again, that shape just goes such a long way. It has a longer stem. You know, Dotato or Mary Lane Seedless or even, um, you know, I even thought about getting Isbat on Naj, not that it is in this category, but Dotato itself and Mary Lane Seedless, they're very round and they split a lot more often. And Dotato itself, I found, absorbs moisture so easily into the skin that it gets completely ruined by rain. It's so, it's it really is one of the worst varieties I think to possibly grow. Dotado, Kidota, there's so many names for it, uh, and they're not all the same. You know, there's different strains of Dotado, different sources of it, but the few that I've grown, they're just garbage uh, here in this climate. Anytime it rains, they absorb it right into the skin, and the figs are ruined. They produce a ton of fruit, produces doubles, produces at an early date. Uh, you can make an argument. It'd be a great performer in a dry place in like a shorter season climate, maybe like somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. But for me, my money, and I've noticed this year, is on Moscatel Bronco, Corinth, that Peter's Honey strain. You know, I really like those honey figs. The, they have yellow skin and the amber interior. I don't know if I could ever really put one of those in this top 20, you know, I, they'd have to be a really impressive tasting fruit. We'll see. I do enjoy them, but I don't know. My preferences, I think, um, are just elsewhere, you know? Um, also Zafiro though is just so different than those and complex enough to where I can put it in this top 20. And I've seen the shape. I've seen the fruits. They just do, they do, they do well in the rain. And yeah, I even proved that to myself uh, the year I had it. Um, and that uh, it was really the only fig I remember at that time that got through so much rain and still ripened properly. And I brought it to the Staten Island Fig Festival, gave it to uh, a couple of friends to try. It was actually pretty darn good for considering. And at the time, we had you know met for dinner, I think, beforehand and uh before the event and we had all these fruits to share with each other and no one really had anything reasonable because of the rain it was just like i think we had like three or five days of rain that year um and again this zafiro was really one of the very few impressive fruits at that table um so let's see what else do we got here uh all right, so moving on to the late ripening fruits. We've talked about De La Senora Hivernenka in the past. This one, I, I still need to evaluate more of it, but um, my tree, again, I, I killed the tree. It was grafted. Didn't really get to evaluate it this year. It's so small on the ground, I, I can't really do anything with it. Um, I'm lucky to even have the variety still. Um, you know, so I can't really still evaluate it, but there are some clones of this that we got a decent look at this year. And this is really the Black Madeira, I think, replacement. But it's sort of different enough to where maybe 
actually we'll talk about in a second some other black meteor replacements like calderona or colonel Littman's black cross which are really i think more direct comparisons to black madeira whereas de la senora hivernanca is just a very different fruit but there are other you know varieties of uh of this so verto long is one this year that i got the fruit that i think is very similar to that fruit you also have col de dame Catat, which i've acquired as well people are starting to fruit labritia which i have stated before is really just De La Senora Hivernanca, or Hivernanca for short. This is a commercial variety, by the way, that's grown all over Europe, particularly in Spain. And uh, it's just a fantastic variety. It really is. The, the fruit quality is amazing. It does ripen late. Again, these commercial varieties, you have to give them credit. You really have to give them credit. The same thing with even Black Mission is that it's not a great fruit, but I bet you any amount of money there is one that's really impressive because not all of them are the same you know not all the hardy chicago types are the same not all these black mission figs are the same you know so we're we're even trying trialing some of those black mission types uh but de la senora hivernenka for me or at least those hivernenka figs definitely belong in this top 20 100 percent um so i'm excited to try more of them now there is a Black Madeira direct replacement this year, which I believe is just called Arona. And it really is so similar to Black Madeira. But to me, it tastes more along the lines of something between a Black Madeira and an Adriatic fig. So if you took prosciutto, combined it with Black Madeira, that's, I think, what you would get is called Arona. It's very complex, intensely flavored, very good berry flavor, very sweet amazing fig and the nice part about it as you can see here this is how it hangs the stem is a bit longer than your typical black madeira the neck is very pliable so the neck on black madeira as we mentioned before is very stiff and the fruits you know typically this fruit would be kind of hanging up in the air right now if this was a black madeira but calderona tends to droop down avoiding a lot of that rain hitting that eye uh not totally obviously but uh, what I've noticed is that it's very productive, just like Black Madeira. It's got similar characteristics like Black Madeira. I don't think it's necessarily too late either. There's even a Calderona de Minor, which is very similar, that I'm also growing, you know, that I think actually may even end up being a bit better in humid climates is the Calderona de Minor. So I don't know. We'll see. Uh, for me, at least, I've been really impressed with it. And, um, you know, it even has a better shape. It even has a pyriform shape to it. If you read through Ponza's book, right, we're always looking for the fruits that are either pyriform or ovoidal in shape. Typically, those are the shapes that are going to do the best. Um, they're going to resist splitting the most. So it's kind of weird that you would think of Calderona as pyriform, but that's what it is, oddly enough. Uh, the other fig, again, I would mention is Colonel Lippmann's Black Cross. And um, that one just, I've really been struggling to get it to fruit. It fruited last year for me this year, and this year it fruited again. Um, but both of them, I think one, last year it got eaten by birds. The birds stole it from me. And then this year the, uh, the fruits were just too late. But and it does need a lot of light. So that's going to become a factor, I think, at some point, and how easy it is to get it to fruit. Super vigorous variety, uh, but again, very, very tasty fruits that I think typically have a better shape to them. They're a bit smaller than Black Madeira, more pyriform in shape, um, and they should do way better off. And it's even, I think, a little bit earlier, as uh, my friend Phil has mentioned. So, yeah, I... I it's got a lot going for it, that particular variety. We can't put it in the top 20 just yet. And I'm not sure if it's even better than Calderona. So we'll have to find that out too. Um, I want to talk about Juale Noir. So Juale Noir... Well, in actuality, let's talk about all three of these fruits. Because right now I'm actually thinking... and. If you counted all these, I think it's more than 20. But 
what I'm thinking is that these pr three particular fruits are really cold Adam replacements. The cold Adams belong in this list, 100%. They belong in a top 20 list. It's so hard to beat a cold Adam in terms of texture, flavor, the way it performs even. It's just some of them are very finicky. I typically haven't had the healthiest cold Adams in the past. We've really been trying to rejuvenation prune them and make them more healthy. I know my Noir is extremely healthy now. My Cold on Blanc is extremely healthy now. Uh, my Grease is base is almost dead, I think, and and my Roja is almost dead. But we even have planted now Cold on Gigantina in the ground. We've planted uh, Cold on Mutante in the ground, and these are all getting very healthy, well-established trees that we'll eventually get to evaluate and see if, uh, you know, what the deal is, if they can eventually replace, or maybe even just simply cold and on Blanc is really the superior cold and on. Now that it's going to be healthy. Now that I have rejuvenation pruned them, there's less of those fig mosaic virus, but also I've been seeing with these other fruits that I've been trying to grow that are very similar to a cold and on, like, let's say La Bourgeoisie, uh, you also have um, De La Roca, Juale Noir, Lampiro One. You have Broccolette. You have Sarda. Um, there is a number of them that really, I think, in my mind, resemble a Golden Om. I even have one fig called Nin, uh, Nin ZS that I think might be similar-ish even have another one called uh that's a unknown from uh from italy that i think might be very similar so we have a number of figs that we're placing in this category and they're going to duke it all out and so far i think juale noir is quite different than a cold dom but the texture is very similar the shape is very similar they're all very similar uh, you know lampira one is also quite different but again supposed to be similar to the cold Dom's. So I'm putting them in this category for now. What I like about Lampira 1 is that it has good drying capabilities. It's very hardy, and it should do very well in the rain. I really liked the flavor off the very limited experience I've had of it. De La Roca, also rather limited experience, but the fruits dry well as well. So Lampira 1 and De La Roca, I think, may have an edge over the cold and alms in that the cold anoms can dry, but only really in drier places or in really dry weather. Whereas De La Roca and Lampira 1, it's not out of the out of this world or out of the question for them to actually dry on the tree here or even shrivel. So I think that's something to be said in that those two to me seemingly are having a, a higher edge. Now, I could always put them in the fridge, cut them in half, put them on the skin side down on a plate, and they'll start to dry up just as a cold anom and that would be amazing. So I'm not really too concerned necessarily with that anymore, but I do think it's a nice little bonus that if they do have drying capabilities that, uh, you know, they're, they're typically going to resist more of the crap trying to destroy it, you know? So for me, my money's on De La Roca or Lampira one. I think Juale Noir is, is, so deserved of a place in here. I even harvested a fruit a few days ago, late November, that actually was very good. Um, it, it's amazing how cold it was, but um, it even sweetened up. Whereas earlier in the year, it didn't seem like it was very sweet, but it finally sweetened up. And it's an amazing tasting fruit. The problem with it, and there's one problem, is it has a longer hang time. So it can be difficult, I think, in really rainier places with that longer hang time and therefore it can be a problem uh some of the other things here that we're looking at just really quickly in this b tier um you know what actually before we move on really quickly to this b and c tier i do want to mention that for anyone in florida what you're looking for again is a shorter hang time fruit so what you're looking for is black celeste naruchello de elba verdino del nord Campaneri has a shorter hang time, but you really want to eat something even shorter than that, I think, which is De La Senora Hivernenka has an extremely short hang time. It's only three or four days. I know Iranian Candy has a really short hang time. Um, 
There's a fig called Pel de Boo, which has a really short hang time. Let's see, what else over here has a super, super short hang time? Yeah. There's another one that I'm not thinking of uh, that really has good place in this whole thing. Uh, special characteristics, maybe? Short hang time. I mean, De La Roca even has a shorter hang time. LSU Champagne has a very short hang time. So these are f fruits, guys, that you could take advantage of in those places. And I know that this is my top 20, but in the top 20, you got De La Senora Hibernica. I mean, that's pretty darn great. And this is probably, th it may even be the best tasting fruit in this whole grouping. So, you know, it's not like you have to, you know, fight for scraps to get something good. Um, all right, so let's let's go through this real quick uh, and make some just quick judgments about the fruits here. So, Borgesoat Grease, I also think could be thrown into this category, as well as Violet Support. One of them I think is going to reign supreme. I was really shocked at how great that they fruited in my high dense system. They don't need a lot of light to set the fruits. Um, they did ripen a bit later than I was hoping. Um, but they don't typically tend to split. They do really good with moisture. They taste fantastic. They do have a longer hang time than I'd like, I think. But here's what's nice about them. I think for the size, the production on them, they're right up there with something like a Moro de Caneva as a commercial option. I think it's one of the better commercial choices, even in a humid place that you could grow. So I think that's gotta have some credit for sure. Um, Let's see here. We talked about some of these already. The Daloso improved for me. I really like the shape. You know, the, the length of the stem, the length of the neck is huge now. Um, Grease de St. Jean, really impressed with that. I think it may split a little bit more, th more than I like, and therefore it may be stuck in this category, in this B tier. But, you know, there may be one of them. Like, uh, I think Loretta was one that, seemed to taste a little bit better than the other Grease de St. Jean types that I had, and it didn't seem to split as often. Gayette is a Dalmaty type, which I think definitely belongs in this B tier. Now, if there's one that doesn't split, although Dalmaty and Gayette, they don't split that often. However, they can split, and that to me seems to be enough. Even just a smaller opening of the eye is enough for some of these fruit flies to get in. You know, like... If I were to compare Gayette to Black Celeste or Gayette to Verdino del Nord, you could just tell it's not in the same class. It's just not. Now, Gayette seems so far to be a great fruit. We still have to evaluate it. You know, I think it's actually a very tasty fruit. Uh, you may even, you know, classify it as like a larger Col de Dom or something like that. Uh, you know, it's very interesting for sure. Uh, but for right now, I think we have to leave it in this category. Um, LSU Purple, I think, could also be very impressive. And for me, it's actually quite an interesting honey fig. I don't think it's as boring or weird as people think. Uh, the skin could probably get a bit bitter when it's cold outside. Um, let's see here. Let's keep going. So Unknown Mitica and White Triana... We also have Sister Madeline's Yellow and Safrari. These are four figs that I'm trialing against each other to see which one's the best. So far, White Triana is the king. I absolutely love it. I know my friend Dan Foster was saying that he actually likes Safrari from Bass, which I picked that up a while ago and was trialing it here in the ground, as I think it's one that Bass recommends that you grow in the ground um, and will um, do well in fruit in one season even if it dies all the way to the ground. So these types are all similar in that they're these big jelly figs that get nice and thick, but they have a long hang time. Some of them split more than others, and that's the problem. You know, How long is it going to have to hang on the tree, and how often is it going to split? It may forever just be in this, these B, this B tier. You know, It's a shame, but it's reality. Um, Negra de Agde. This thing was impressive too, and I was shocked because the shape isn't great. You know, it didn't really split. It's I, I would say it's kind of like the similar situation of, you know, 
what we just talked about is white Triana. It's a similar thing. You know, how long is it going to have to hang on the tree and how often is it going to split? And for me, it seemed like both of them were okay, but yeah, I think it just needs, it may need a drier place than where I'm at. And we'll find out in the future. Uh, Pastel the air. I haven't really given up on it. Um, I know that this fruit can split and that's typical because it is a rounder shape. However, the stem can be longer. So the fact that the stem is longer, you actually can get a good hang on it and it can hopefully resist some of that splitting and we'll see, you know, I think there may be a more superior strain or may maybe a more superior way of growing it, et cetera, et cetera. You never know. Um, Ponte Tresa has got a great shape to it, a great flavor. I want to see, now that I planted mine in the ground, how it changes and how it becomes a better fruit. Another one also is I would put in that category is Pepone. You know, Pepone is very ov uh, ovoidal in shape, kind of like these Corinth types and uh, Moscatel Bronco types, even the Sister Madeline's Yellow. That's the one thing, by the way, about Sister Madeline's Yellow that I liked versus the others I mentioned is that it's more elongated. It doesn't seem as fat and has a better shape to it. It dries well on the tree. Um, so I, I would say Sister Madeline's Yellow seems to have more, um, you know, I'm, I'm more favored towards that one than the others right now. Uh, let's see here. Sucret. I think Sucret we need to do the same thing is that we need to evaluate it in the ground before I can move it into uh, the higher tier. Violet de Bordeaux, you know, the problem with Violet de Bordeaux, and again, we don't know if this is going to continue in the ground, but in, at least in the container, it got some cracks in the skin. And when it got those cracks in the skin and it rained, it seemed to form this green mold in the skin. And that was happening quite often. Otherwise, it's a very impressive fruit, very impressive variety that checks every single box. But for that reason, I have to put it in my B tier, you know? Um, I mean, that's how serious we are as Violet de Bordeaux is in my B tier. I mean, how ridiculous is that, right? Um, so, so far, I mean, all these fruits in the top 20, I mean, they check all the boxes. They check all the, the things, and I haven't really noticed anything really blatantly or glaringly wrong with them just yet. If there is something like that, then they may have to get moved down to the B tier, you know? Um, and then, of course, in the C tier here, I want to mention, like, some of these fruits. Like, uh, one in particular is Long to Duke, LSU Huye, LSU Tiger, um, Rondé Bardot. You know, these are amazing varieties. Negretta. These are these varieties are so amazing that I would still consider them a keeper. You know, like you'd be lucky to have a variety like those. But it just seems like they split a little bit more often than I'd like. And for me it just is a is a problem. Um you know, LSU Huye, for whatever reason, LSU Tiger, you know, they're just splitting like like crazy this year. I had a lot of fruits that split this year, and I was really surprised to see LSU figs split. You know, that just doesn't seem right to me, but they did. Rondé Bordeaux, I would have said this was in the B tier last year, um, but it just was splitting enough, or the eye was open enough, and then the fruit flies were getting to it. You know, it wasn't even that it splits and then it gets ruined. It can resist a lot of that. You know, it has a good resistance to spoilage, but the fruit flies were rampant this year. So I had to bring down some of these fruits. It really is a shame. Um, maybe it was a little bit of reality check with all those fruit flies and this and that, but, you know, it is what it is. I mean, it's amazing, though. I want to mention, like, how many hundreds of varieties I've tried and, you know, how many of these are really unique and in that tier, you know what I mean? Like, it's just like, there's so many crap varieties. There's so many crap figs out there that really, I don't think belong in anyone's collection. Like, and people keep trying to sell them or pawn them off or promote them or give them fancy names. And it's like, 
man, you know, I just can't believe it. Like some of the, the characteristics of these fruits that just, uh, yeah, it's just mind blowing. So anyway, that was this video here, guys. I hope that you enjoyed this. This was a long one, but I think a lot of this needed to be said and to, uh, kind of explain a little bit more on these, these varieties. Um, yeah, we'll catch you guys soon for the next one. More end of season thoughts are going to come out about maybe something more about varieties that we'll talk about. But a lot of the things we've learned is going to be discussed. So again, check out the blog, figboss.com. Hit the subscribe button on YouTube. I'll see you guys soon, all right? Take care.